Welcome to Spaces Between, a podcast about bringing gamers closer together. I'm your host, Roy Candy, and with me today is Corey Thompson. What's going on, man? Hey, Roy. Long time no see. It seems like we bump into each other at conventions all the time. Oh, so, yeah. It's fantastic being on Spaces Between. Hype. So if anybody doesn't know, um, Corey um, has been doing stuff with Dice Tower News for quite a while, and he also has a new, like, vlog type like uh like thing where you take designers out for meals called dice tower dish um and you take them out to these different restaurants and talk to designers about all sorts of different things oh yeah started it up in september i think uh basically got in touch with a bunch of designers uh went wherever they are take them out to nice meals it's really funny some of the designers want to go out somewhere fancy some want to go to a little hole in the wall And I've done breakfast, I've done lunch, I've done dinner, and we just kind of chat. It ends up being about two hours of just freeform talk about anything. gets pretty weird, but we talk about games they've done, games they are going to do. Uh, It's been a blast. Still going strong. That's awesome. And and you have, like, the best di- dice guy because you have a dude holding cake. <laughs> <laughs> I got two of them. I got one holding cake, and I have one who's sitting at a table with a big old uh, Flintstone steak. That's awesome. <laughs> so. Cool, yeah. So if anybody hasn't checked out the Dice Tower dish thing yet, make sure to do that. But uh, who all have you had on your show? Oh, man. I think right now I'm on number six. Mm -hmm. So I started with John D. Clare and drove down to L.A. and hung out with him. And we went to a little hole-in-the-wall Indian restaurant that was just amazing. And he was – he's just a dude, just a friendly guy, and we talked about everything. Uh, Did Matt Leacock. So we went to a fancy place in Palo Alto Mm -hmm. and had a nice talk. Um, Greek restaurant, wonderful food. And then Scott Caputo, who did Wings – I'm going to say Wingspan, but it's not Wingspan. It's uh, Whistle Stop. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All the W's, they're all the same. And Sorcerer City. Birds, trains, you know, whatever. Yeah, you know, you know put a bird on a train, it's all the same. Uh, recently, I did three interviews, kind of shotgun back-to-back when I was at Essen. So I got to take Friedman Fries out to dinner. And uh, oh, he's, he's just crazy. Uh, the guy is hysterical. Doing all sorts of goofy stuff. Did you guys eat then, green food when you were talking with <laughs> Freedom and Fries? It was kind of funny. We went to this fancy business lunch restaurant, and it's almost like they knew. They sat Freedom in, in this little alcove that had a green jungle backdrop painted into it. <laughs> That's and, awesome. You know, it, it was really cool. And he just looked around. And he said. Yeah, this seems right. <laughs> mm. And then um, Frank West, the designer of um, City of Kings, uh, took him out. And uh, finally at Essen, I got to interview Uva Rosenberg. Oh, nice. And that was, uh, that was a big one. We'd been emailing for a while. And, uh, yeah, he agreed. And it, it was interesting because... I'm about 80% on German, and he's about 80% on English, so we were uh, mumbling at each other a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I brought uh, Uli. Uh, had you met Uli? Um, I he's, know of Uli, but I don't know. Maybe uh, I have. He's the greatest, nicest guy in the universe. Uli uh, was kind of the handler at Essen. So if anything oh, nice. required more German than any of us had, Uli just took care of it. He made reservations for me and he acted as translator when uh, when I was talking with Uva. Oh, that's awesome. So it was it was really cool. That was a very fun interview. So one of the uh, things that I enjoy is that like with your your whole interview style is you do very much the same sort of thing as like open dialogue open stuff i enjoy like the fact of letting the conversation flow wherever it might and just hey we're gonna talk about whatever comes to the top top of your head because it then you can talk about things you're passionate about right oh it was crazy yeah it's crazy we talk about all sorts of strange things uh uva it's really funny um so i met with uva and he said and i'd been emailing him for a while telling him what i do and how i do it and it's a meal and it can be a couple hours and all this business I met with him on the floor, 
And he said, okay, I've got about 10 minutes. Where are the prepared questions? <laughs> and I kind of stared at him, and then Uli translated and told him the absolute insanity that I usually do. And Uva looked like a deer caught in headlights. His eyes went wide. He <laughs> said, I've, I've never done anything like that before. And he was panicked. So he told me he had... 15 minutes and we could go to the cafeteria but he didn't know if, if it would be okay and he wasn't sure what he was going to say and we ended up talking about two hours and he was laughing and having a good old time by the end of it so it, it all went it, well it's awesome like when you just let conversations flow like how, how how much fun and enjoyment and how much you can actually get to know the person you know oh yeah uh, Uva was a statistics PhD and he started doing card games because a friend of his had come over and said, you know, there's this card game in the United States that seems to be selling pretty well, so I think card games are the future. So Uva made a card game just to kind of make one and to have a job. That's and, awesome. Uh, they were talking about magic is what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. and I so think Uva Uwe made... Rosenberg's games definitely resemble magic a lot, right? Not really. <laughs> He's a math guy. He's a statistics guy. You can see this weird math playing in everything. So uh, he had a job. From what I understand, he had a lined up job with his statistics degree, and he could keep it on hold. He knew that if he took a year or a couple years, he could come back to it. So he kind of played the field and tried to see what he could do. <laughs> and I, I guess he just never went back. But that was Bonanza was one of his first games that he did, and that's still his number one selling game, both in numbers sold and money, which is crazy considering all the other games he's done. So what you're <laughs> saying is it made serious beans. It made serious beans. Uh, two to three <laughs> fields of them all of one type did really well, <laughs> but the order couldn't be changed at all, so it was kind of stuck the way it was. <laughs> that's awesome so I think the first time I met you Corey was or at least the first time we got to talk a lot was at Dice Tower West oh at the first Dice Tower West yeah last yes. year that's coming up again real soon yeah so. I'm super stoked about uh, going back out there um, oh, yeah, it was cool too. getting to meet you how did you get like tied in to start doing Dice Tower news and different Dice Tower stuff I think it was on the very first Dice Tower cruise Oh yeah. So I knew of Dice Tower for a while. I'd watched videos and I thought that all the work that uh, everybody was doing was just fantastic stuff. So um, on the first cruise, I introduced myself to everybody and I bumped into Rob Searing and just basically said, is there anything I could do to help? And, and it fell through from there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And I got to know, you know, Tom through uh, a lot of the the charity auctions, a lot of the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund auctions. Uh, I tended to be the the weird guy in the background who bid <laughs> on the big thing, and uh, like, mine, I think that mine. <laughs> yes, yeah, so in case people don't know, every year Tom auctions a giant box of games for the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund. And it tends to be a highlighted item. It's one of the first things on the auction. And uh, it can go for, for an okay, a decent amount of money. And I, I enjoyed it a lot. I thought it was fun just getting an enormous box of games. And Tom would say, you know, I can guarantee you three of these are good and three of these are terrible. Some are in <laughs> shrink and it's just a random grab bag, which is right up my alley. I, I think that's great. And uh, I won it every year for a couple years. And then I was in an auction battle with someone online, and he privately messaged me and said, you know, can you just let me win this one, please? <laughs> and we played behind the scenes a little bit. So I think that was the one that I didn't, I didn't win. Whatever, man. You should have still like been like, yeah, sure. And then last minute, be like, <laughs> oh. He was way too nice online. I couldn't do it. So uh. I figured whoever wins it, you know, there's the money's going to a good cause and. He broke your it's streak, awesome. though. Come on. I can start a new streak. I think I've won <laughs> it four times, five times, something like that. Nice. That's awesome. It's always fun. It's a giant box, man. 
Uh, it put together a big box of just random stuff. The last time I won it, there was a dog toy in it. Dude, I remember <laughs> literally, because I was in the studio when they were putting it together. I was like, oh, Corey won the box again. And then, like, I'm sitting in the studio. This is behind the scenes. And they're like, Corey won the box. It's like, man, he, he the box went for a ton. We got to make sure this is worth it. So we just started, like, throwing everything in. And it's like, how about this thing? Throw it in there. How about this thing? Oh, throw that in there. What about this used piece of gum? You know, and not quite, but it felt like there, that. Oh, there it was were like, just really throw some stuff things. in there. So, oh, yeah, there were packets of sleeves, used games, games I had really bizarre stuff. There was a Korean Bible-themed card game that was just all in Korean in the last one. Uh, a French card game called Danny that is a social interaction game that I learned later, you know, is kind of dirty. But... Uh, <laughs> You never know what you're going to get in the the box of surprises. So, oh, I love it. It's uh, you know, if I go to a restaurant, one of my favorite things is if I could just tell them to bring me anything. It's, it doesn't matter. Just bring any food. I don't want to pick. So, big box of surprises is always a good one for me. <laughs> That's awesome. I know you've done gamma and stuff like that a lot too. Yeah. Um, and Tom said you've helped him out a ton at gamma. So, how's that? Uh... Because that's more like a, it's not a convention for the public. It's like a thing for publishers and game stores and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I like Gamma a lot. And to be fair, uh, it's not so much that I helped out Tom. It's more that I begged Tom a whole bunch that I could go, and he said okay. So well, he, he said you were nice a lot of help. So I don't know. Like I don't know what you did. But obviously, you stuff. did a good job. Whatever it was. No, really, I just kind of crashed the party. But uh, I met a whole bunch of designers at Gamma, mm-hmm. and it's fun here. And you know the stuff behind the curtain. It's fun watching how the sausage is made, and uh, I made a lot of connections there that kind of led to doing the interviews with Dice Tower Dish, like uh, uh, Frank West, who did City of Kings, one of the interviews that I did during Essen. I met him, I think, the first year that I went to Gamma, and super nice guy. We just got hit it off, got along so well. I'm. Uh, I'm hoping to go to Gamma again this year, so you got to give Tom a little nudge, a little mm-hmm. poke, see if I can do it. <laughs> I think he did say something about Corey's got to go or something like that, so we'll see. Ah, uh, that's all right. It's he always decides at the very last minute, and every if it year, all falls, every year he's like, "We're doing less cons, we're doing less cons," and he's like, "But we should go to this one and 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 this one." This oh, there's one. so many starts... now that are necessities, and Pax Unplugged had to pop up out of nowhere and be an amazing convention. You know, UKGE is so good. Uh, it's hard to decide which one to drop. But, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, I, I think even if uh, things fall through, I'll still end up at Gamma somehow. I can make it happen. <laughs> it's crazy because there's so many cons. It's like, because uh, c- basically we always want the channel. I mean, we run a YouTube channel with reviews. Yeah. Tom does reviews. I edit Tom's reviews. We have tons of live stuff. But, like, when we go to these cons, it's always, like, we have to do prep work. Like, we do, like, double work the week before. Oh, it's huge amounts of work. To, to, have, to have the content up. So, it's, like, Tom normally does 12 reviews a week. So, that means we're doing, like, 24 reviews in a single week. <laughs> so, it's – I mean, we normally try to make it so it's, like, okay, we do – some extra six extra this week and then six extra this week. And that makes up for the other week. But it's like, Oh my goodness. So many videos, you know, but uh, trying to make sure that there's stuff popping up online while you're not there making the stuff. Basically make it seem like we're not gone when we actually are gone. And I mean, we put ourselves on a pretty like strict schedule because we're always trying to do more, make things better and continue to put out content constantly. But it's, it's, kind of crazy sometimes because like we we do all these things um but it's definitely worth it and it's fun because uh we try to be knowledgeable or have that information out there for people because i mean there's so many big games like all the big games get shown you know but there's all these tiny games that are like in the nooks and crannies that don't get seen as much and the only way they can get seen is by making tons of content you know oh there's so many games coming out constantly now it was really neat. The very the first year I did Gamma was the first year that it was in Reno, mm-hmm. and uh, I helped set up kind of the the junket room where everybody lined up and showed off their stuff, and it was a constant live stream out of that room. 
That's great. It was fascinating because there was so much bandwidth in that hotel. It was ridiculous. Tom was literally going around trying to figure out how can we use all this bandwidth. So Tom would have a live stream from one bedroom and Z would have one from another bedroom. And Kenny would <laughs> be running the press thing, people in and out doing live streams from the main room. And they're just all broadcasting constantly. It was so fun. I wish I could do that again, but I, it's too hard bringing everybody to Gamma, especially so close to Dice Tower West. It oh, just puts sure. people out of commission for a long old time. And that year, they were back-to-back. -back. There was maybe one day between Dice Tower West and Gamma. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, it was insane. So, And then they all got snowed in in <laughs> Reno. So I couldn't make it back. I, I was driving, and I got snowed in. So that was fun. <laughs> I actually heard that uh, Sam got to stop by. You're always trying to get people to come come see your game collection. I mean, I heard Sam <laughs> got to actually stop by and maybe see the game collection. It's, well, I don't know how much he really saw. Um, I've got I've got a couple different houses, and the game collection kind of lives and it migrates between places. But uh, Sam, you said was... you said you've got a collection the size of Jason's, but it's actually opened. Yes, I have and more. And you're allowed to I play the say, games. <laughs> I would say that I have more opened games, but less total games. That's kind of oh, my gotcha. guess. You know, I've talked to Jason back and forth about it, but who knows? I don't know. It's probably not that, but I'm I'm right around 2,000, I think. And uh, so Sam was driving all the way up California. He he came in from the bottom, was going all the way up to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I told him he could crash. I have a house right on I-5, which is the main north-south highway in California. And I told him he could crash, and he said, that's great. He, it was nuts. Uh, it was uh, Sam and uh, Mike Parkinson. Yeah, yeah. They were driving together. They showed up at about 10 at night because they'd been driving all day. I bet. And I figured... You know, Sam's been driving for days and days and days. He's probably burned out. Just leave him alone. Give him some quiet time. You know, give him some food, a bed. You know, don't need to do anything. Now, he he turns around and said, well, let's play some games. <laughs> so he started pointing out games in, in one of the shelves that he wanted to play that he got hadn't gotten a chance yet. Man didn't go to bed until like 2 in the morning. That's crazy. And then got up at 6... And was on the road by eight. That's literally it, insane. It was. It was nuts. But it was a really nice visit. Um, yeah, Mike was. <laughs> he he's crazy. Uh, I was trying really hard to get Mike to take a cot or an air mattress or something. He just insisted he's going to sleep on the couch. <laughs> so you know, him and my cat were hanging out on the couch. Yeah, my, man, Mike Parkinson's another person that I should have on the show. Um, he had a segment on Board Game Breakfast for forever where he'd remake games all the time. Yeah. He helps us out so much at conventions. He's such a nice dude. He's just so helpful all the time. Oh, he's so, yeah. I've known him from conventions, you know, for a long old time now, and he's always spectacularly nice. So that was a really cool visit from Sam. Uh, got to feed him some good food and play a couple nice games and not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't help with the whole resting part of this this thing. I anymore. tried hard. I I didn't like, go to bed. It, it was crazy, but I was a little disappointed. It's uh, we went to. He stopped at the house that was right on the route. It's a nice house, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of games there. And I'd moved them around, so there were some newer games when he arrived. But the really nice house was a little off the route, and I kind of wanted him to stop there. But uh, he, he didn't want to compromise. It's, Corey has uh, multiple he, gaming he races. Okay. <laughs> well, you, know, you get enough games, and you gotta you got to put them somewhere. you got to buy another you house for your games. You know how it is. Come on. That's, I, this is I don't know do. how it is, Corey. <laughs> oh, well, I actually just had a gaming convention at the other house. Uh, we have a convention once a year around New Year's at uh, the house is in an area called Shiloh. So it's called Shiloh Con. Oh, and nice. uh, 
we have about 30 people, uh, and there's a couple gaming tables around, and we had probably about 500 games there this year. That's awesome. Uh, we had a four-person VR set up in the garage, pinball machines, arcade <laughs> machines. Now, that would be super meta if you, like, played Catan via VR or something while all the other board games are just sitting there. <laughs> well, that's all we do. You know, you just put on helmets so you don't have to talk to each other. <laughs> no, one of, one of my friends... You put on the helmets actually... and you accidentally run into each other. <laughs> it's easy. They were, sm- they were smacking each other every once in a while. <laughs> but uh, awesome. one, one of my friends actually told some video game manufacturers about this convention I have every year, and they donated games to it for this year. Oh, nice. So, yeah, Ubisoft and Sony donated some games. It was kind of fun. That does sound crazy. Yeah, I only played a little bit. Uh, Most of the time I was was doing board games. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, some designers there, too. Uh, Johnny Pack, you know know Johnny Pack? Uh, Johnny Pack Canton. He did Coloma, Fistful of Meeples. Oh, nice. And uh, Sierra West. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And he lives kind of local, and he... Kind of last minute, I invited him to come, and he said, Oh, that's great. Sounds wonderful. Is it okay if I I bring my my SO? And and I went, Yeah, not a problem, but it's a little packed. I don't know if I can guarantee you, like, private space or a bedroom. There's a lot of bedrooms but there's a lot of people and he said oh we love carpet crashing it's great and he showed up with monique and they set up a blanket fort in one of the side rooms (laughs) so they had their own little private space it was amazing i don't know why nobody has thought about this in years past but he had he brought blankets and stands and tripods and just set up a little fort with a little flap at the front and that was incredible we had a really good time. So he did a couple prototypes, which was really fun. Uh, donated some games. It was a blast. So still recovering a little bit from that. It was. We went for five days. Not a lot of sleep. But my hope, constant gameplay. <laughs> my hope is that someday I'll be able to be like I've got like a game design in the works or whatever that a publisher is actually trying to pick up. But my, my hope is one day be big enough that it's not awkward when you bring a prototype to like a thing. Cause like if you, <laughs> if you've never made a game and you bring out a pro- prototype, people are just like, who are you? What are you doing? But if you're like a big name designer, people line up to play your prototype. You know, it's like, Oh man, you made Sierra West and like all these other huge games. Or it's like Emerson, like I line up to play Emerson's prototypes oh. all the time. Or Eric Lang, it's like, oh my goodness, I want to play your next prototype. Like that's yeah. the dream is it just makes game design easier when people actually want to play your game because they you don't say prototype and they run away, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are kind of nervous about prototypes anyway. But uh, yeah, it would be really cool to have that, that name recognition. That's, oh yeah. That would be really fun. You just have to have... Uh, the, the first big hit right the first like everybody's like oh man they made that game then it's like oh they actually know what they're doing because i mean i'm not gonna lie there's a lot of times when people are like hey i made a game you're like you made a game okay cool <laughs> I've, I've played a few of those yeah i'm just <laughs> oh yeah it's a blast uh a lot of the people that i interviewed had kind of a similar story that they would make a game, one of their early Mm -hmm. games, and it would be incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. And then they'd kind of go off on a tangent and just make whatever game they wanted to make, and it didn't matter if it was crazy or weird or terrible or good. It was just the game they wanted to make. But they had this constant income from their first game. So you make the great one, and it supports you when you just spew out bizarreness. And it's it's really neat. So, uh, like, Freeman Freeze made Power Grid was one of his very first games. And that put him in a position where he could, he could make any game he wanted. And he makes really weird games. Some of his are just way out there. There's, there's a game about cannibalism and comparing different people and how much nutritional value different people have <laughs> <laughs> called Frischfleisch, which is fresh meat. Um, he did 504. 
Yeah, which, yeah, which is crazy. Technical design is an absolutely amazing. Oh, for I, sure. I can't believe anybody could actually make that. Um, but he made it for himself. He made it because it's a cool idea, and he knew, he thought he could do it. And it didn't sell great, but everybody says, you know, wow, that's kind of incredible that it worked. How Things important like do you that. think, like, name recognition is, like, in this industry? Like, oh, this designer made that or that designer made that. I think there's a very small pond, a very small group of gamers mm -hmm. who know the names and will go off of name recognition. And we tend to preach to the converted. So, you know, I'm talking to you. So right. if I say, oh, there's a new Feld game, mm -hmm. then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and you'll keep an eye out for it. And if you see Feld on a title, you'll just buy it up immediately. Right. But I think that's relatively rare in the board gaming world as a whole. I think mostly it's word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, people, or they play something and they think it's great, so they go out and they seek it out. And then later they might learn certain names or certain designers or certain publishers even that have a feel that they like. Um, it's getting a little weird now, though, because there are some designers who will put their name on something that they've not developed themselves. Mm -hmm. There's weird crossovers going on because... Um, and it goes both ways. Uh, Uwe Rosenberg will find designs that he thinks are really, really cool and help the designer through it and sometimes get credit and sometimes not. Hmm. So he was kind of instrumental in Terra Mystica coming through. Hmm. And a lot of people don't know it. He's in the instructions, you know, as a thank you to. Uh, and then there was a game, Lowlands, which is labeled as an Uwe Rosenberg game, but he didn't design it. Interesting. So, all these strange little things. Um, neat story. Uva actually feels very, very strongly that uh, designers should credit other designers when they borrow mechanisms or things like that. And so, Uva was playing um, a game, uh, Habitats, which is from Kowali Publishing, and the designer's Corne. And he loved it. He thought it was just the greatest game in the universe. Mm -hmm. So he took that mechanism that he loved and made his own game, called up Cornet and said, I've made this game. I took your mechanism. I'm putting your name on it. So the game is Nova Luna, mm -hmm. and uh, it's credited to both Uva and Cornet. That's awesome. But I think, I think Uva basically made the game using Cornet's mechanism. That's awesome. And it's a cool, cool puzzly, patchworky kind of game. So I, I like those stories. I like the the designers talking and collaborating, and you know, we're we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. So we borrow oh, all sure. the time from, from everyone else, and there just should be a little more credit with it. Yeah, I feel like there's so many great designs and mechanisms that can be twisted and turned different ways to make a different game output. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah like the way that games come together. And I know there's some designers out there that are like, oh, I never play anybody else's design and stuff like that. But I feel like... <laughs> now, knowing... who has said that over and over? <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. actually, Reiner, Reiner Knizia says that every time he's in an interview. I don't right, play other people's games. That's crazy. Um, I feel like it's important to know the like current state of game design, you know? To know like sure. where things are and what's going on and there's so many games i mean i'm exposed to this stuff daily listening to thomas talk about <laughs> i like this or didn't like that and even though i don't necessarily get to play all the games it's like there's so many things that you see come through it's like huh that's interesting and sometimes there's games that are that have interesting ideas but sometimes miss the mark and then there's sometimes like just stuff that if you'll see a game it's like why didn't that designer like this problem's been solved in these kind of games over here like Obviously, if they would have just used I this that these that. other games are doing, this problem wouldn't be in this game, you know? It's kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's a couple designers out there who can look at the way games are moving and the trends that have been going on and can tweak it just that tiny little bit and make it really, really interesting. My favorite in that world is uh, Shem Phillips with Garpel Games, Raiders of the North Sea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Architects of the West Kingdom. They took worker placement and just 
tweak, change one little bit, didn't make it more complicated, didn't make it a lot of rules and a lot of exceptions, just change the actual core of it in a simple way that's elegant and works really well. So always looking forward to seeing what, what they've got coming out. Yeah, there's, um, there's just... I feel like there's so much opportunity still for exciting and interesting games to come out. I don't feel like... Uh, innovation is going to stop in board games i know there's people out there like oh we're in a board game bubble doom and gloom all the time but there's <laughs> there's every year there's awesome new games coming out so there are there are but there's every year there is an absolute fountain of games coming out and you have to kind of wade through the dreck so yeah for sure i think that's what they're worried about with the bubble yeah, I had Chaz get... on last week, and we were talking about how yeah, how well... can someone figure out which games are good and which games are bad when just so many games come out. And I was like, Chaz, that's our job. Like, that's what we do. We're board game media. <laughs> like, we have to, like, I mean, be like, hey, these games are awesome. Hey, we played these. I mean, maybe you'll like them if you like this kind of game, but maybe it's not for you. I feel like that's the service that, I mean, we're trying to do at the Dice Tower is to – help people know and make an informed decision for themselves so there's so many games though yeah or at least just be exposure Mm -hmm. you know you say well here's 50 games that i've played and i've seen and here's what i thought about them and if they sound exciting go play them um it's a strange industry in that there aren't a lot of board game stores out there a lot, not a lot of people talk about board games if they're not right there in it. So exposure, I mean, there's no commercials for board games. You don't run into it in mainstream media and television. We need, if we want exposure, if we want to see all the new stuff that's out there, we have to seek it out. We have to look for it. And I think that's the role you guys are playing, is lists, exposures. The reviews are nice, but it's it's about saying what new stuff is out and what the designers are doing and what exciting stuff is on the horizon. Did this make this top ten list or that top ten list, or are they talking about this Kickstarter or that thing or whatever, you know? Oh, yeah. It's fun stuff. But, uh, yeah, I, I was the kid who always waited for... Um, you're probably too young for this, but the Sears catalog at Christmas time, which had a I little remember, middle section, it was all toys, you know? So you'd look forward to the commercials on Saturday morning television because that was your exposure. You saw all the stuff that was coming. I remember uh, as a kid, always my parents would give me the little J.C. Penney's catalog or whatever, and yeah. circle the things I wanted. I always circle electric guitar. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of a board game nerd even back then, and I, I think I'm quite a bit older than you. But uh, I remember early '80s, all the friend, all the people I knew, we were all divided. Where we were going to get Dark Tower, How or were we going to get the Electronic Dungeons and Dragons board game? Oh, and you can only pick one because you know parents were kind of savvy. They knew they were kind of the same thing, and they weren't cheap. <laughs> so I remember. I remember a dark tower uh, box in the basement. It was my dad's friend had left it at our house, and it was there. I never played. I just remember the tower, and I'm kind of excited that, original, that, they, that they're it bringing it back for restoration. Beast. So, oh, it was a beast. It took D cell batteries. It waited. <laughs> t- it would you know spin and make noise at you. I backed the wrong horse. I didn't get it for Christmas. I was always just intensely jealous of my friends that did. I got the Electronic Dungeons and Dragons board game, which I know you hear a lot about nowadays because it was so good and popular. (laughs) I sense some sarcasm (laughs) coming. (laughs) It was terrible. It was it was a grid. It came with nice. Uh, pewter real D&D miniatures uh-huh. like one of them or two of them and you'd press it on the spaces of the grid to show that you were moving and if you accidentally moved where it thought was a wall it would make this noise and you had to put yeah. a little plastic wall there and it was just feeling out the maze and every once in a while the dragon would randomly eat you <laughs> it was a delight nice <laughs> Yeah, that was probably so, with 81 or 82. 
No, 83. I think 83. That's cool. So with Dice Tower Dish, um, yeah. as far as like uh, designers go, is there a dream designer that you'd love to have on your show or have to interview? Absolutely. Uh, it's Eric Lang. Um, a lot of the designers are pretty far away from me, and I'm willing to travel a significant distance to go interview these guys, but there's some limits. It's kind of hard to drive to New Zealand and interview Shem Phillips. Uh, <laughs> or Singapore. And Eric Lang, you know, he technically lives in Singapore, but he travels so much. I would love to get him, even if he's anywhere in California, which I know he does, Oh yeah, for sure. I would I would drive down to L.A., which is a, a probably six seven hour drive for me, but I, I would totally do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've written, I've talked to other cool mini represent. I bumped into Eric at mm-hmm. um, Essen and gave the whole spiel and the whole pitch, and he said he was excited and he would love to do it. But it's so hard to get in touch with the man. He's, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he's incredibly busy, so he's mm-hmm. way up there on the list. Uh, it's kind of funny. I've had multiple like meals with Eric. Never interviewed yeah. us that way, but I've actually done two interviews with Eric, but they were awesome. at the Simon Expo or whatever. So it's com- sure. kind of different. Yeah, he Not the same goes- thing as <laughs> taking Eric out to a nice place. <laughs> Eric took took me out to the nice place. I was like, let's eat Indian food, and I hung out with him and uh, Emerson, and and that was a lot of fun. I'd love to get Emerson, but he's nowhere near me, you know. Most of the East Coast people I've got to try to hunt down a little closer. But when I started Dice Tower Dish, I pitched it to Tom, and, you know, it it was nice, and he was supportive, but he said, you know, make sure you've got a number of people who are interested in this. And so I wrote a whole bunch of people and got overwhelmingly positive emails Mm -hmm. back. They all wanted to do it, but they're all kind of far. So uh, J.B. Stegmeyer said... Yeah, definitely. When are you going to be in, you know, St. Louis? <laughs> and uh, the list went on. So now some of these people that I've written back, well, I'm talking back when I started, but it was only a couple months ago. Mm-hmm. Now some of them are going to be in my area. So next week I'm going to go out and have uh, dinner with Rob Davio. Oh, nice. Because he's going to be, and he was up there on the list. That's awesome. And later on, uh, there's a good chance that I'll get Jeff Engelstein cornered. Mm-hmm. And that that will be a fun interview. He knows so much about game design and game theory. And I, oh, for sure. I like that stuff. I follow the nerdy, you know, ludology side of it pretty closely. Love talking about the psychology of it, the math of it, mm-hmm. all that crazy stuff. So... Still lining people up. Would love That's to awesome. get uh, Elizabeth Hargrave, but uh, who we're did never design really Wingspan? Who Not did design <laughs> Wingspan? I know that. I I know my designers, man. I do my homework. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, hey, if you need me to hook you up with Emerson, me and Emerson are like this. Oh. I did. I played some games and did some prototypes with him at Dice Tower West. It was really fun. It was super nice. That's the only I, time I've ever. He's coming interacted. back to West this year, so maybe maybe that'd be an opportunity for you. There you go. Ooh, I wrote a couple of the organizers of West and said, "Give me the list of designers who'll be there," and they just they didn't. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know if they one hundred percent know, but I know there's a few people that are going. So. Oh, that's cool. Hey, I'll fire an email off to Emerson. I think I wrote him. Listen, I'm Dice Tower Dish. Don't you know who I am? Come on, man. I'm the only non-video person in the Dice Tower. My Dice Guy (laughs) holds a piece of cake. Not even Tom Vassell's Dice Guy holds a piece of cake yet until he gets one designed. He's got a nice hat, though. There you go. There you go. (laughs) I don't know. I always thought that doing it written doing it not as a video i thought the designers would be more free talking about new stuff that's coming because if you've got a prototype or a new idea and you're on video the prototypes look weird and ugly the ideas don't come through in the video but if you're just chatting about it and you write it down they sound great oh yeah so it seems like it was a better path 
you can really give your stuff. concept as opposed to like showing the concept, you know. Yeah, showing a prototype is a two-edged sword. It's fun to play with, but hey, they look like, you know, someone doodled on white cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> and I get that. It's uh they're protective of their designs and they don't want any bad press going out about it, so they don't want to show anything that looks ugly. Um and it, it's panned out. A lot of the designers I've talked to have told me about things coming way in the future. I think it was when I interviewed John Clare, he went like five games forward talking yeah, about mean, what he's on. So many of these guys, I mean, I don't think people realize how long games are in the production line. Like oh, it years takes and years. two years, yeah. basically at least two years, if not more, from when they sign the game. It's like, I sign the game to a publisher, they're going to put out in two years. So it's kind of like, holy smokes, yeah, because they got to do all yeah. the... I mean, once the designer is done with the game, and, and it's been, depending on whether or not it's going to be developed even more, then it goes into oh, like, okay, the they got to do all the... Yeah. yeah, they might have to develop it a little bit. If they don't have to develop it, then it's still, they got to do all the graphic design, get all the stuff ready in, in uh, wherever it's being manufactured, work on manufacturing it before it comes out. There's so much stuff that has to be done. I mean, even oh, Kickstarters... Yeah that are supposed to be like, okay, this is going to be to kickstart your dream. You still have to have everything in place and ready before that Kickstarter starts, you know. All your ducks lined up. Yeah. Yeah, and delays happen. It's uh, That's the big problem with most of these Kickstarters with someone who hasn't done a bunch of them is they, they line it up, it looks beautiful, and then they go a year late because mm -hmm. they don't have every one of those little ducks in a row. And when you're interviewing a designer about like, oh man, your hot new game that just came out, you're talking to them, them about a game that's like three, four, five games ago. They're like, I haven't played this game in a couple years. You know, <laughs> it's kind of yeah, that sort of thing. And that's that's one of my standard questions I usually ask them is, uh, do you play your own games? Because by the mm -hmm. time it actually comes out, you've played it a thousand times. You're oh, probably for sure. a little tired of it. <laughs> played it over and over and over uh no the process of getting those suckers out is crazy and just the the emerging role of board game developer that's a really cool area where a game is brought to you that is rough and you need to cut bits and polish the edges and make it more playable and make it more balanced and just iteration after iteration that's really cool yeah, there's definitely uh, a ton of different aspects and like a ton of different roles that go into play in uh, actually producing and getting a final product of a board game. Oh, yeah. It's insane. Uh, the biggest thing I've seen with all of these designers is just the tenacity, that their ability to be able to plug at it over and over and over and over and just make it right. Yeah. I'm not sure I could do it just for that aspect. I get neat ideas, and I'll sit down and say, oh, this is cool, and I'll put these bits together, and oh, look, there's something shiny. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, That's the hardest part is, like, continuing <laughs> with the idea and turning it into an actual prototype. And then you play the prototype, and that doesn't work quite right. So it's like, all right, I have to chop this part of the prototype off and edge this thing here and try to figure out how to way to have your idea become a fun, yeah. actual experience in game you know oh yeah what is it it's early game designers add more and more and more to their design and experienced game designers take away more and more and more from their design oh, for sure so and you can see it i i actually think there's a little bit of a magic spot if you pick up a designer's first game mm -hmm. they're crazy they're why they do <laughs> bizarre things because they made Bold decisions, not know you know, not knowing that they're dumb decisions, but they make big bold decisions, mm -hmm. and you just get these insane designs before they know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I always like that. So, I'm trying to think. Uh, so some of the early ones, like Voluspa, is a tile laying game that's just all over the place, and it's really fun and really nuts. And that was uh, Scott Caputo's early one. Uh, John Clare's first was a fighting game called Kapow! <laughs> it's, uh, it's nuts. It's all over the place. That is just neat stuff. 
So since you have so many games in your collection, do you have like a Grail game out there that's still like a game that you're looking for or trying to get? No. <laughs> you're like, nah. I just if it was nah, a Grail game, I just get it. But I just yeah, I have a ton. And you're talking to me, you know, right after Christmas, so I pretty much <laughs> You're like I had Grail games before Christmas. I did, and I went to Essen, so I got my Grail games at Essen. Uh no, it's fantastic stuff. Like the crew probably would have been oh, one, yeah. but I picked up one of those. It's really fun. Listen, Man, I'm not even it. a fan of trick taking games, and I played the crew, and I really enjoyed it. I love the feeling you get when you do a partner trick taking game, mm-hmm. playing Tichu or Hearts or something, where you've got a partner and you're doing this thinking without thinking. And there's so much lateral thinking in these things, and the crew is nothing but partner. Yeah, for sure. All of you are working as partners. <clears throat> so I really enjoyed that one a lot. I actually played it with uh, my wife and my son. Uh, he was home for a Christmas holiday, and we played the crew up to level 40, oh, I think. nice. That's crazy. So we've gone really far in it. It's a blast. It keeps getting pulled out. <laughs> It's like you have to play uh, every single card. Every card that you're dealt <laughs> has to be given to a specific person in a specific order. What? <laughs> ah, there's nuts things in there. And I don't know why someone hasn't done it before. It's an obvious, wonderful idea. Mm-hmm. You know, trick-taking's been around a while. People inherently usually understand what trick-taking is. It is a simple trick-taking deck. Basically, it's Whist, Mm -hmm. which is an ancient, ancient, ancient game. And you just say, okay, your goal is to do this. And it's brilliant. It's -hmm. it's a wonderful game. If it's not... I'm positive it's going to be nominated for Spiel. It'll probably win Spiel. It's it's that good. It's just so elegant, accessible, and and wonderful. Nice. And then... uh, I played a whole bunch of Cooper Island. Mm. Have you gotten to play this guy yet? I haven't played it yet, but I've heard of it. Oh, I really enjoyed it. It's magnificent. Uh, it's got a little bit of a weird learning curve. It's one of these games where every single rule is printed on the board or the player board somewhere. And it just looks like this intimidating pile of icons. <laughs> but it's it's elegant. It works. It's a really good game. Uh, Maracaibo I've had a lot of fun with. That's mm-hmm. been really great. New Alexander Fister game. Right, right. Uh, oh, that's been a blast. Um, Coloma is kind of delightful, but I'm cheating a little bit because Johnny Peck's friend. <laughs> but Coloma, Coloma I was way impressed with before that. It's a really good six-person, doesn't-take-too-long, elegant design. Like, I've heard his games are good, but if you see his blanket forts, they're... Way cool. Oh, his blanket forts are amazing. I'll tell you, my cat <laughs> was a huge fan of blanket forts. Every night, my cat would walk to the flap entrance and scream. And they'd open the flap, and he'd walk in, and then he'd spend the night with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you, you go. Know, I, I, I could, you know, get lost. It didn't matter. You know, he had new owners, and I thought they were going to take him home. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I try to keep these things at an hour, so I guess we're pretty much to that point. Are we now. at an hour already? I know. It's like these things go by so fast. I always feel like oh, it's fun goodness. when you just get, get lost in conversation. It's like, oh, let's do this. But um, Where's yeah, the if anybody's around? interested. Where's the weird questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody's interested in where to find any of your content or where to find Dice Tower Dish, where can they find all of that stuff? Uh, Dicetowerdish.com. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. It's organized by designer. I try to put up new chunks of interviews about every five to seven days. Uh, each interview's long form. I do it transcribed just as it's recorded on the audio, little comments and pictures sh- shoved in there. Uh, so it's about six postings per interview. Uh, but Dicetowerdish.com, easy peasy. Mm. And, and where should uh, Eric Lang and Emerson and everybody hit you up at if they wanted to reach out to <laughs> Specifically to Eric Lang. Eric Lang, if you're listening, meal. hit If up anybody wants a free meal, and it can be 
any meal. I'm telling you, I'll take you to the best restaurant in Napa Valley if you want. <laughs> and uh, Corey at DiceTower.com, you know, it's, I'm easy. I'm not cheap, go. but I'm easy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. I do want to remind everybody that the Dice Tower Kickstarter is going on right now. Um, so make sure to check that out. If you haven't checked it out, go to DiceTowerKickstarter.com. Um, hopefully, this is a week after it's come out. We record these a week ahead of time. Hopefully, we've met our funding and everything's awesome. So thank you so much, everybody who has supported us. Y'all are all amazing. Um, but yeah, if you want to check these out, we do these on iTunes for the Spaces Between podcast. You check it out. Just search Spaces Between. Also, this goes up on the Dice Tower channel. I'll make sure I have a playlist there as well with all sorts of awesome interviews. Um, and that goes up every Monday at 5. So awesome. And thanks again, Corey, for coming on. It's been a blast. Oh, thanks, Troy. It's a blast. And I'll see you at uh, Dice Tower West. Yes, for sure. It'll be awesome. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.